This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight, I bring back Aaron Gullius and Mike Cleland, and we deal with part six of UFO history. And it's been almost exactly a year since we started this, um, which was originally going to be one show and is going to be uh, at least seven parts at this point. We cover the late 1990s here, and uh, that's really all we get over uh, before the show end. They'll be back in a few months to uh, to do the 2000s, and we'll see if that's the last part or not. It might be, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 16 years. Also, both of them have new books out. Uh, Mike Cleland, of course, has his owl book out finally, The Messengers. And Aaron Gullius has one out on conspiracies. They'll both be talking about those at the end of the show tonight. And they'll both be back individually to talk about them as well. I may have an extra piece out of this for patrons, and if you want to become a patron of the show and help us uh, continue doing at least two shows a week, as we've been doing for the most part, go to uh, wheredidtheroadgo.com and click on the patron link. It's only $3 to become a patron, and I give away interviews early as well as extra stuff, and uh, eventually we're going to have some merchandise, which we'll get as a, at a discount and uh, also first shot at if you're a patron. And I have some other stuff I'm going to be giving exclusively to patrons as well very soon. For $3 a month, you I hope, feel it's totally worth it. It's also helping us to, uh, to do more shows. And uh, right now we seem to have a pretty solid two-show schedule now. We have this main show, which airs first on Saturday night. And then we have a midweek show as well, which I've been meaning to rename but haven't been happy with any of the names I've come up with yet, rather than just calling it a midweek podcast. And I want to thank everyone who is a patron. Uh, you're helping out greatly um, as well. Really, everyone who's listening and talking about the show and uh, letting other people know about the show. Started this three years ago, and uh, I really had no idea if anyone was going to care or not. And uh, I've had such awesome response from people listening to this show, and uh, it's really been awesome. So thank you all. And now we head into our fourth year. All right, so here's the interview conducted a couple of days ago uh, with Aaron Gullius and Mike Cleland, part six of the history of the UFO phenomena. All right, and I am joined once again by Mike Cleland and Aaron Gullius as we do part, uh, any idea what part it is, guys? Five? I I think it's five. It could be six. It's somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah. uh, Of UFO history, and... uh, we made it up so far to the mid '90s. Yeah, which is which is basically the present, right? I mean, yeah, more or less. The older I get, the more yeah, the '90s exactly. feel like they should be the present. Until you watch a you know, whatever a TV show from the '90s, and then, you know, or yeah. see like a special effects from the '90s using yeah, computers. Yeah, VR you know. five or something from uh, some some failed five episode sci fi series from the '90s, and yeah. that you thought was cool twenty years ago. Well, it was cool. It was, actually, ago. yeah. It doesn't seem like it should have been 20 years ago, but, you know. Oh, 20 years. 20 years, yeah. <laughs> no, 20 years. I feel like a, yeah, like a, <clears throat> yeah, 20 years goes by things, quick. But before we get to that, speaking of things from 20 years ago, did you guys watch The X-Files? Yes. Yes, it's I've seen all, I've, I've seen all three episodes, and, and, and I was never that much of an X-Files fan. I didn't even discover it until well into the, early 2000s so i was i was a fan from the the, the very first episode back in 93 and uh, i i i pretty much i i agree with with everybody 
online who said that the first episode was was not great the second episode was yeah and the most recent one this week was um was incredible um oh i yeah. just the opposite. oh my god just the opposite. it was it was hilarious this. i hated the oh. comedy one. Oh. well you know the, the it did have the, owls in it too so the darren the darren morgan episodes um they are you know people either love them or hate them and uh, sometimes he's, and this one verged on being a little too clever for its own good, but um, but it was yeah. it was just, it was fun. It was fun in a way the X Files hadn't been for way too long. The conversation in the graveyard absolutely killed yep. me. I just wanted to go back and watch it again. Yep. So yeah, I, I thought the first one the first one initially when it first started, I was like, uh, oh, really? Roswell? Yeah. This is where you're going with this. But then it kind of twisted around to these weird conspiracies and I went, All right, that's a little more interesting. Yeah, the second one was all right. But then this one, because of the sort of comedy aspect and the quirkiness of it, I thought was brilliant. Yeah, I, I liked the first one. I um I didn't really buy Joel McHale as the conspiracy theory TV show. I, I just it, it, he, it just didn't. I like him, but it just didn't work for me him, yeah, him in that yeah. role. Um, but I, I, th- I thought the sort of relaunching the the sort of conspiracy mythos or trying to rebuild that or build it in a different way. I, I some people are complaining that it contradicts stuff from the first run, and I'm like, who cares? I mean, the the series, you know. You really get the impression when you watch the whole nine seasons, they they couldn't keep track of their own no. internal continuity. So why not just you know <laughs> junk it and you know start over? Because and to be honest, I don't remember it, so it doesn't matter to me. I remember bits and pieces, and I yeah. I didn't understand. I, I knew everything that was going on, and I was up on it until that first movie, and then the post movie. X Files storyline. I was just like, I I can't keep track of this. And then the 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 last couple seasons with the whole super soldier thing. Um, that mm. that just uh, wasn't even like the same show anymore. Uh, and by the way, this is part six. I six. Just six. Okay. Six. Let's see if that's the magic number for finishing. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard to say. There's not as much stuff that happened. You know, the '70s and '80s. Well, really, from the '50s to the '80s, it was just layered with so much different stuff coming up. And mm-hmm. it seems like in the '90s, it it kind of died down a little bit. And there's not as much unique stuff occurring uh, or coming to light as it was in the previous decades. That's. I agree. Um, the 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 late '90s, especially after the Roswell 50th anniversary. Um, it just everything turns into sort of a greatest hits compilation, and um, there's not nearly as much. And once the 2000s come along, it's it's just kind of depressing in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but one of the things we did see in the 1990s, although I can't really say when, is you got more and more of these hoax videos. Yes, because. Because the equipment became cheaper and the editing became cheaper. And, of course, the closer to the future we get, the easier it is to make videos like that. Easier to make really good videos, too. Yeah. 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 And I have a hard time with some of them because there's like a – how do you say it? Like, you know, sometimes CGI is hard to, like, verbalize what's wrong with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you can can just kind of – Feel there's something wrong with it, you know. It just feels yeah. like you're not looking at real footage, or you, you're looking at footage that's been kind of manipulated somehow. And um, and so I'm, I go off that gut, Im, you know, impression sometimes. Um, and I, and to be honest, I'm really bored with with you know YouTube videos of 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 uh, you know dots in the sky and things yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. Which is sad. Is it, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a goodly percentage. I don't know what percentage it is. Probably higher than we would dare think. I think there's fewer hoaxes and more real videos than you know. Uh, they, except the hoaxes get the more of the drama, you know, flooded into sure. them. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it, it's thing is thing is for me. I, I never really got into the whole photo and video evidence thing, and and so I was even more disenchanted with it when the uh, the YouTube CGI era hit because it, at the very least with the traditional photographic and film 
hoaxes, there's some really interesting, fun stuff you can do to try to figure out how they did it, um, right? So if, if something is, is you're pretty sure it's a hoax because it looks, you know, too good, sort of the Mil- Billy Meyer sort of thing, um, yeah. you know, you could sort of say, admire the craftsmanship. But, uh, you know, the, the new stuff, it's, it's just some, some kid playing on a computer. It's just like, and I, I agree with that, hard to put into words what's wrong with it. And, like, the closest I can get is it's bad CGI. You know, that, that's the, the sort of catch-all, how do you know it's a fake? Well, it, it looks like bad CGI. It's, yeah, like, exactly, yeah. <laughs> or maybe it looks like good CGI, but it still it, looks like CGI, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It, I, mean, I mean, the Star Wars prequels were full of good CGI, but it didn't mean I wanted to watch it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, yeah. and it, it, it's the same, it's the same sort of thing. It's, it's, uh, it's hoaxes without any sort of craft or soul to it that really bug me. I don't care that you're lying about the flying saucer. I, I just want you to do something cool, you know? Um, and, and, a, and a lot of this stuff is just, <laughs> ugh. Oh, yeah. I, I think, I think too, there's, there's different types of people who look for this type of stuff out there. They're the people who just want the truth and they don't care what the truth is. You know, they're going to tear it apart and keep looking at whatever moves them, mm-hmm. you know, that seems most true. But then you get the people who sort of just want to be entertained. Right. And they might want to believe there's aliens, but in the end, what they're really looking for is some kind of entertainment. So when they see these hoax videos, they're like, oh, my God, look at this, you know, and, and they just believe it because it's entertaining. Yes. You know, that sensational aspect of things does play a factor, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, I, I think, I mean, it, it's not a difficult case to make that, that the Internet ruined ufology. Um, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think Usenet has a lot to answer for. I mean, if you guys were on alt-alien visitors back in the 90s, it was, I mean, it made it made Reddit look like Pinterest, you know? It, it was ju- just, <laughs> you know, just vile and horrible and mean and little bits of brilliance here and there, but but mostly just, you know, by 99 or so, it was just a troll farm. Um, but uh, but then now, I mean, all of these these Facebook groups dedicated to to various um various mostly exo politics stuff um it's just these are the most credulous people you've ever met in your life and um speaking of the x files i mean the x files as vehicle for disclosure you know that whole thing started up again because they mentioned the word disclosure so it must be real it's it goes beyond <laughs> bad cgi videos now we have bad cgi arguments right they're like simulacra of real critical thought but it's fake um just to try to get to you know get people to i don't know tweet their congressman about uh about disclosure it's 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 got no soul well and i'll just go jump on the exact opposite of that where i think that coming (laughs) from the abduction end of things or the experiencer end of things the internet has been i mean i the folks that have met each other i mean so so we're talking trauma in a lot of mm-hmm. you know ways yes. and people who've experienced something the, the the who've had the contact experience have had whether moments of trauma or it's disrupted their life in a in a very challenging way and these people are connecting online and it is a like i don't know like a love fest sometimes i mean people are really like mm-hmm. it's remarkable how bonded folks can get as well as i mean exactly the kind of social networking that that you know deserves the name you know where folks can connect you know where it's happened to me so many times where like oh even if facebook has been amazing i mean facebook is such an easy target it's so easy to make fun of but (laughs) i have communicated with some amazing folks really quickly you know, like have a conversation with someone across the country instantaneously and say, oh, this person has to get in touch with this other person because their stories are the same. And, 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 and it's, you know, these things are, are never would have been possible. So, so it may have, and I agree that it's like, there's just horrible websites out there that are, that are grinding out stuff that makes my, you know, toes curl in my shoes. But, um, (laughs) but at the same time, there is, there's a very human aspect to this digital age. And I think, I think that's, that's absolutely true. And I, I think that's illust- an, a good illustration of, of what this, this technology is, 
is good for. It's good for creating and nurturing those connections between people who honestly wouldn't have had any other way to really connect with each other on that level. What it's done is it's devolved ufology and, and abduction research and all of these things. It's, it's devolved it from this sort of high level, it's the UFO movement or whatever, down to, um, down to uh, the sort of street level interpersonal connections, which is, as you pointed out, are, are often you know, amazingly important to people who have suffered uh, some kind of trauma or other uh, other transformative experience. Um, so, so I think what it does is is the stuff that irritates me. It's the stuff that that also probably should really be irritating groups like Mufon because what this does is it is it's sort of just it's a massive broadside shot at the UFO establishment. If I can. I hate saying something. That's a stupid phrase, but it's... it's well, MUFON's an easy target, yeah. So. It is. It is, because they're terrible. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I think I think what this uh, what the, the new technology does is is that the benefit of it is exactly what, what Mike was saying. Um, and, and the downside of it, the, 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 the dumb nonsense and, and bad hoax videos, I mean, that really doesn't have any sort of negative effect on what on what Mike was describing rightfully as as a, a very positive aspect of this um, I think that's uh, it's actually one of the one of the cool things about it is is people who can find each other and basically ignore the big organizations because they don't need them because yeah. they found other people who have um, different perspectives and maybe more more broad perspectives on uh, on what they may have experienced I would I would think that being, you know, someone being in that exp that situation where you've had this UFO encounter, this abduction experience, or however you interpret it, going to someone of any kind of authority, MUFON or whatever, and talking to them, talking to somebody who may not have had that experience is not going to be the same as being able to talk to other people who have had the experience. You know, you get that disconnect where I don't, I don't think anyone who hasn't had the experience can fully understand what they've gone through. Right. Yeah, I mean it's like an it's like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's you more know? of a more of a support group and less of um, less of an institution, an institution that, I mean, not to to denigrate anybody, but you know these big organizations and the famous researchers they're they're using their contact with with abductees in order to further their own their own career and their own research and their own speaking engagements and their own books and when it's people who are sort of on the same level communicating with each other i think that that makes it it makes it more possible to feel be open and possibly not feel like you might be getting exploited in some way or led along to come to conclusions that you don't really want to come to and and I've actually found very little evidence of folks like, you know, oh, peddling their their research. I guess there's like some examples out there, and it would be kind of mean spirited for me to just to like, you know, because it's all subjective. But um, you know, I think that a lot of people who are doing this research are doing it for very very like genuine reasons. You know, like from a very deep place of curiosity. Not a, no one's profiting off of. I mean, if if you want to. Don't write a UFO book if you want to make any money. You know, <laughs> write any other book in the world, and you'll you'll make more than if you write a UFO book. <laughs> write write a very sensational uh, sci-fi novel about UFOs. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so around '94 was the t first time I think John Mack published anything about abductions. He had a few books before that, but he put, uh, put abduction out in 90, 1994. And he was one of the few going in a different direction in the 90s. Well, I mean, that's not, I mean, other people were certainly in his direction. Leo Sprinkle was in the, going in that direction for sure, you know, a little more uh, consciousness minded, you know, and, and so that he was kind of on the opposite side of what Bud Hopkins, Dave Jacobs would have been doing, right. where those were the, oh, I, what's the term? Uh, sinister is the wrong term. And uh, uh, evil is too heavy handed. But, you know, there, there, there was, you know, both Bud and 
uh, Dave Jacobs felt that this the the UFO presence was not good. There was no. nothing good about it. Where uh, John Mack was capable of, and I've talked to folks since in, that have worked with John Mack and said, you know, well, why is it different with John Mack? And they said, well, John went deeper. John was a clinician. John was a psychologist. John went to the root. He said, okay, now we're going to go deeper. And there was a transformative aspect to these experiences that emerged out of John's work. Yeah, and I, I think his his background as a you know actual practitioner of of psychology you know gives him gave him a, a much uh, gave it a, a needed perspective that it didn't necessarily get from an artist or a historian um, doing doing the same sort of thing, and um, it, it gave it gave the whole thing some credibility. I think that it, it might not have had if he hadn't shown up. True, true. I mean, because you don't have a lot of people in uh, academia who are actually looking at this. Right. Stuff. You have uh, you have John Mack. You have Kenneth Ring. Don Dunderry. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, there's a few. There's a handful, but most people were individuals who were just working on this type of stuff. And and uh, you know what's interesting because I don't necessarily know if it gave it any credibility. There's a there's a hope that it would, but I don't see. Well, maybe collectively over the last 20 years, I guess there's been a slow ebbing away and changing at how this is treated in the, in the uh, you know, less so the mainstream. The New York Times still makes fun of it and stuff like that. Actually, I should change my, uh, you know, there was a very uh, even keeled uh, obituary for Bud Hopkins where they talked about his research into UFO abduction where there was no, you know, snicker factor and, and it wasn't derision, you know, there's no derision in it. Yeah, I, I so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe there has been a, a you know, that, that, and maybe John Mack's role in uh, as a as a uh, tenured professor at Harvard, uh, the chair of the psychology department, you know, had something to do with that. I mean, he was he was basically in a position to do whatever he wanted. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, it didn't hurt. <laughs> it didn't hurt. Yeah, it didn't hurt anything. Yeah, and then at the same time, I mean, he was, you know, he st straight up called the whole thing Kafka esque. Mm -hmm. You know that that there was you know like a like a, things that had never happened at Harvard before, like a you know a closed session was reviewing him that he didn't know who was on the uh, the council or whatever right. he, would you call it the and uh, you know it was and basically he was uh, he, like what was, uh, Alan Dershowitz sort of came to his defense, you know, and yeah. and uh, another Harvard professor, and so you know, uh, and said, you know, you can't you can't do this, you know, the people have a right to believe whatever they want to believe, and 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 the 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 internal well, you know witch hunt basically was you know out to they were just like ashamed that their that the good name of Harvard was somehow right. associated with UFO abduction, and that's about all it came down to. Whether whether and and it sounds like very few people actually. You know, bothered to even look at his research. Right. It was. It was. It was. It was almost like hearsay. It's like aliens. No. Oh, you know, this guy. And and who knows? I mean, universities are are political snake pits. So there might have been much like the real Salem witch trials. There. Who knows what other kind of you know political infighting went into these went into these things as well i mean and and the abduction stuff might have been the perfect trigger for one faction to you know take take out another faction it's that that's what's always fascinated me about max you know trials there at harvard is what else was institutionally going on um within the faculty and the administration that that made this kind of sort of very sort of embarrassingly reprehensible treatment of a scholar you know possible um so it, it, it was it's fascinating from sort of an institutional perspective what uh what might have been going on and i never <clears throat> this was he died in 2004 which was shortly before i you know really started making phone calls let me put it that way at a certain point i just became shameless and I'm like if i wanted to talk to someone i'd figure out a way to talk to him mm -hmm. and um and if and i certainly would have found a way to talk to john mack if he was still alive if but you know he died in of a 
walking down a street in London uh, did something that Americans will do is they look the wrong way before wrong crossing way. a street and yep. then he got hit by a car and it sounds like it was a drunk driver and it is very easy to jump to the conclusion that that was some sort of conspiratorial thing oh, I've, talked yeah. to, I've talked to a number of people on both sides you can make a good argument on both sides of the of the of the line um, uh, it's my understanding the family doesn't want anything to do with any kind of conspiratorial stuff yeah. and and uh and I know Peter Robbins had did a great deal of research, including, you know, I think he was spending time in England researching it too, you know, like the events of the death. And he says it was a tragic accident. What is interesting is that it felt like before that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the dirt on the grave was padded down with a shovel. Uh, Susan Clancy's book came out of nowhere, you know, like with yeah. Harvard Press, like right on the cover, like it's basically saying, you know, that there's no such thing as this and people are being deluded into this. And, and, uh, and that, and it, that just seemed so blatant to me. Like, yeah, God, he's dead. Let's get into the book out quick. Yeah. So. All right. Um, I inadvertently Nin took us up to 2004, uh, <laughs> so sorry about that. That's all right. It's not, it's not like we haven't jumped around uh, through this whole series. Um, 1996 was Dr. Reed's Screaming oh Alien Oh, my hooks. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the one in, in where was this? this Washington, I, Washington State. Oh, I don't know this. Okay, so it, it's, as far as I can remember... Um, Dr. Jonathan Reed, not his real name. Hold it, just um, let me let me interrupt. This is like yeah. this, so like if you were in the limousine with Scully and Mulder and they were like, you know, Aaron Gullius, you know, they would have gone, he would have just like said, you know, what is the Dr. Reed screaming thing? Just to test you, right? That's what he would yeah. say. Didn't they do that with the Kelly Cahill thing in the back yep. of the limousine with the with yep. the cons with the uh conspiracy TV show host? Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah. he, so, he, so we're doing that to you right now, yeah. So he claimed, what is the Dr. Reed story? Well, um, he claimed that uh, he was out walking his dog in the woods, and um, a, a obelisk-shaped uh, spacecraft crashed. Um, something disintegrated his dog. There was a recording of the dog's the scream. Dog's um, uh, no, no, no. If I remember right, the, the space ship didn't cra crash. It just came oh, down. Oh, it just came down? Okay. And the dog heard the alien, and the alien ripped it in two and then sent it into another deman dimension. dimension. Yeah, it was, yeah, because he later, Reed, had a wristband or something that he claimed would allow him to travel between dimensions. Um, there were photos of the ship. There were photos of the, uh, the alien body, which Reed took back to his house and put in the freezer. Right, I because I, I think I think he, sh he claimed he shot the alien yeah. after it killed his dog. Yeah, because because that's what you do, and um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then he was on he was on Art Bell a bunch of, a bunch of times. He had a a bunch of researcher hangers on who ended up not having any more expertise. They're they're all employed at the same gas station, and really they they were, and um, and they said, well, we have these experts, you know, who um who you know looked the films and the negatives and and it's all accurate and then when um when somebody said well the the film that he used wasn't manufactured until you know a year after he said he took the pictures they said oh 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 well well let us explain these are pictures of the pictures we took in 1996 <laughs> they're internegatives um you know we, we we had the film tested where are the reports well, well we had it tested never mind um and what's funny is a couple of years ago, when Art Bell came back for one of his periodic six-week returns to radio, the serious radio one, so, yeah, he um, he uh, he had Doctor Reed on on his uh, his XM serious show, and um, and I I couldn't I couldn't believe I couldn't it. believe he did it. I know. Yeah. I was I was just like I was I was like, is this the rerun of the show from 1998? Because that was a pretty fun show to listen to, but no, no, it was and it was telling the same story. Um, and from what I could tell, Art didn't bring up um, Royce Meyer's UFO watchdog expose of the whole thing and Reed's background and the background of all his hangers on. And um, it was that's when I was like, I can't believe I subscribed to this satellite radio to listen to Art Bell. And Art Bell is doing this. And then I realized, yeah. wait a minute, of course yeah. he's doing this. He's Art Bell. Um, he's got less credibility than most of his guests some days but um it, it's it, it's a it's a hilarious story because 
before the the whole thing was was sort of exposed. That's not a verb. Um, exposed, I guess. <laughs> exposed. Um, there were so many like MUFON officials, and even I forget the guy's name, but the, one of the guys from the Center for UFO Studies, you know, came out saying, you know, we verified his story, and this is the most you know exciting thing that's happened in a long time. Um, it was it was just such an out landish outrageous story oh oh and he was on the run from the feds because the feds yes. wanted to destroy the evidence and kill him and so he was he was risking his life all six times he showed up on coast to coast am or something um and, and the screaming part came after he put it in the freezer and then a few days later he heard screaming oh, coming from his right. garage and he went out and opened the freezer and the alien was alive and screaming and he has these audio recordings of the scream yeah yeah, it's it's still not as creepy as Mel's Hole, but um, it, it is a it is quite a uh, a troubling troubling scream. Yeah, and and it goes so far away from all other UFO literature. Yeah, yeah, from the 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 sort of you know obelisk shape to the the you know whole interdimensional thing. It, it's it's weird. It it, it really. It reminded me of the kind of story you'd get back in the 60s when there wasn't yet a standard script for alien UFO encounters where you'd have all sorts of different creatures and different types of mm -hmm. uh, types of scenarios. So so it was it was sort of refreshing in that sense. And it was nice to have, you know, a, a good old fashioned con man with a creepy mustache running around again. You know, that that's <laughs> that's something that uh, that was missing from the field. And I, and I remember listening to that Art Bell show because I had actually forgotten all about this guy. And uh, I'm listening to it. And as he's telling the story, I'm thinking, this doesn't sound plausible. And as he's telling more, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm Didn't this guy get thoroughly debunked? <laughs> Why the hell is it? Oh, well, Art must. He's just going to tear him apart at some point, right? No. Well, then, um, I'm just going to turn this one off yep. and pretend I didn't just waste my time listening yeah, to it that. Yeah, was, it, was, it was distressing that, um, that Art was, was just, just pretended like this was almost like a, you know, a classic story from one of our favorite guests and tell us your wonderful tale again. It's like, no, wait, he's shown to be a liar like about 18 different things. Yeah, um, including who he was. Yes. Yes, uh, and oh, the the expose is just amazing because um, uh, Myers just went and talked to like people who knew him back, you know, before he came up with the fake name and everything, and he lied to them about other stuff about being a child psychologist working with victims of horrible crimes and the the oh, just one of these sort of serial storyteller type people who who just go from from uh, from fake life to fake life any any of this ring a bell mike you know absolutely nothing is ringing a bell <laughs> so i think you're making this all up i think this is some sort of hoax <laughs> to test me you, know. you can you can actually find i think both his actual account and the debunking account still online yep. with all the photos and the, the recorded scream you know i feel like i have a pretty good like you know radar for these kind of things what's, what's the term radar like that's not the term where like you just well like i if I, if if I had heard the beginning of this story, I would have just walked away and, and found more interesting stuff to uh, to uh, uh, yeah yeah to fill my mind and with yeah. So the 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 walking the dog in the forest, seeing some kind of sheer black UFO. Okay, the alien ripping the dog in two and then throwing it into another dimension is the point <laughs> where you go. Awesome. Well, the Maury uh, Island event, they had the dog get hit by a piece of aluminum slag and killed a dog. So. Was, right, but that's that's different than a than it ripping the dog in two and throwing it in another dimension. Yeah. I mean, it's not that it killed the dog; it's that it's the way it killed the dog. It, it needlessly showy, I, I, I think. Um, you know, it's it was, well, it was sort of sort of like, well, you know, what would really sort of spice the story up? Let's rip the dog in half and throw him into another dimension. <laughs> I mean, you can't disprove it, right? Right. The <laughs> dog's gone now. No autopsy on the dog. He's in the fourth dimension or something. So he's he's <laughs> he's down with the with David Icke's reptoids from the lower fourth dimension or something. All right, let's move on. Oh, this is one of Aaron's favorite ones. Uh, the Heaven's Gate. Cult. Oh man, they were they were awesome. Um, and this was March twenty sixth, nineteen ninety seven, that this all came to a head. Yeah, and it was. Um, 
what, what's really fascinating is is not just that there was this this you know UFO scented cult that committed mass suicide. It's one one thing that was interesting is they've been around forever. Um, if you read uh, Valet's Messengers of Deception, there's you know a whole chapter on uh, on Applewhite, uh, Bo and and Peep, the two leaders of uh, of the of the the group and and what they're they're up to and and back in the the late seventies or whatever valet was like these people are up to no good you know this is this is not a safe thing but the whole the whole suicide of the the group was tied into this hail bop comet that um that was supposed to be um that was well was coming very near earth and was a big astronomical event and that people said was being followed by an alien spaceship, a companion to Hale Bop. And, and this was publicized mostly on Art Bell's radio program. Sensing a pattern, people, about the 90s? Um, <laughs> Art Bell having liars on his show. Um, so the, the, the Hale Bop thing, it was, and the thing is, it was also tied together with remote viewing, which became popularized on Art Bell's show um, with people like uh, like Ed Dames and uh, other more credible remote viewers. And the, the, the key figure in all this was a political scientist from Emory University named Courtney Brown, who had a side job as a kind of weird remote viewing guru, um, running something called the Farsight Institute, where he was training people in um, in remote viewing, and he had some like couple of really like whole show back when Art Bell was five hours, like entire show appearances where he was going through what he called the raw data from these remote viewing sessions about this massive spaceship behind Hale Bop, and then added to all this an amateur astronomer in I think Texas named Chuck Schrammick said that he saw. You know, this he had the, the the film of it. He had the, a picture of it that was being sent to a a quote top ten university, to um, which had verified it, but uh, they weren't going to tell you which university because they wanted the university to tell the public themselves. But they kept saying, if they don't come out with it, we will tell everybody who it is. They, I don't think they ever did. Um, it was it was you know, over, from November through January of uh, 96 into 97, this was a, a sort of recurring thing on Art Bell's show. And, and one of uh, Brown's disciples, Prudence, shoot, what's her name? Calab- Calabrese. Prudence Calabrese was on, g- giving her spin on the data. And, um, and then it, it turned out that there, of course, wasn't a, a companion and, and Hellbop didn't cause massive horrible things to happen, but um, the Heaven's Gate people believed that uh, this was their opportunity to, I think, I don't know the way they put it, transition or translate themselves to the level above human uh, to sort of ascend uh, some sort of apotheosis type of thing, and um, the the cyanide pudding and was was part of that process and Art Bell ended up I think he was on Larry King sort of defending himself you know I'm just an entertainer I'm not a journalist you know it's not my responsibility to verify anything anybody says um, but it was it was a wild thing I actually went and found on eBay the the official Coast to Coast AM cassettes of those Courtney Brown shows um, mm. because it was it was just fascinating now it's all you know up on the internet and various places but um you notice they never play that one back on somewhere in time on saturday nights <laughs> um but uh it was it was it was pretty pretty amazing and and courtney brown um he's back at it the farside institute has gotten going again i think in the last few years and um a few years ago uh john ronson's book the men who stare at goats uh he had a chapter where he talked about remote viewing and he, he talked to uh to brown and brown comes across as the most oblivious clueless person on earth and like his whole takeaway from the whole thing is well you have to be careful when you're dealing with the public because the public will think weird things from what you're saying and misinterpret what you're saying and i'm, I'm reading this and i'm thinking you said literally there is a giant spaceship following the comment there's not a <laughs> lot of room for misinterpretation there but um, he had to sort of like, oh, oh, yeah, weren't they the people who killed themselves? It, it's very sort of 
creepy how detached he is years later from the whole thing. It was a strange, strange situation. I remember writing a column for my college paper in which I, I sort of lamented that it would it'd probably be just my luck that Heaven's Gate was right and the rest of us was, were wrong and we all missed out on the opportunity to move to the level above human and um, wouldn't that just be be horrible if they were right and uh, I suspected they were that that one almost got yanked because they said I was being insensitive and I'm like well no I'm actually saying they might be right and we're the wrong ones I'm I'm honoring their memory, but uh, yeah, but no, it was it was a strange it was a strange thing. It, it's it's one of those things where I will go back and I will, I will listen to it uh, those shows over and over again. And other competitors to Art Bell in that sort of mid '90s paranormal radio world, they they really took advantage of this opportunity to 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 sort of you know stick it to Art Bell and and say, look, this guy's irresponsible. He shouldn't be on the air. Listen to us. I know. Um, Jeff Rents had a um, had a whole thing where where he was one of the the earliest ones to sort of you know try to you know object to what Bell's guests were saying and prove it was wrong. And then um, I don't know if any of you out there remember the uh, the Paracast, not Paracast, um, Paranet, uh, the Paranet Continuum radio show with Michael Corbin. They had a roundtable discussion about uh, about basically uh, Art Bell should be you know indicted for manslaughter you know they got pretty uh, pretty riled up about it but um, it was uh, it was a, a a great thing and it sort of really illustrated how deeply that um, that paranormal talk radio had um, had sort of penetrated the mainstream because you know you were getting Art Bell on on Larry King and, and you were getting yeah. other media figures talking about you know, the, the dangers of talk radio, you know, in terms other than they're being mean to President Clinton, you know. So it, it was, it was a, it, what a time to be alive. It, it, was, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Any thoughts, Mike? You know, I followed, <clears throat> I didn't follow this at all. So I was listening. This is all just great. This, I, I was listening to every word. I was drawn in. Yeah, no, I, I have nothing to add. Well done. Well done. <laughs> and, and I would think from Art Bell's perspective, He's probably putting on whatever people want to hear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when you're on a mainstream radio station like that, you got to keep your ratings up, unfortunately. So I, you can't really blame him for having the occasional guest who's full of crap. Yeah. And I, and I think that also folks that, you know, do like, uh, I mean, whatever, Coast to Coast does seven shows a week or something like that, isn't it? Or yeah. six or something? Six. six yeah. I so that's, I mean, I, that to fill that for three hours at a pop, it's, I mean, it's got to be. endless endless tread and, and bell was doing it five hours a night most nights and yeah. and i i cannot i mean listening to some of those old shows it, it's amazing how consistent the quality was um of his 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 um interactions with callers and and his and his, his interactions with the guests um it really was amazing but but one thing that you you get from not just art but a lot of those shows from the 90s is you get very little of the guest cha- of the host challenging the guests in any way. Um, mm. It was very much just a platform for them to uh, for them to uh, to promote their ideas. Um, sometimes art would express a little bit of skepticism or disagreement, um, but not often. And and when he really did, it was very predictable. Like he would always sort of sort of played devil's advocate to Richard Hoagland's, you know, android head on the moon, you know, stuff. Right, right. But, um, but as far as, you know, because he can't really call out a guest as being, you know, a liar, because then sure. it wouldn't be coast to coast AM, right? So <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, by, by 96, 97, Art Bell had morphed from being a fascinating you know, late night talk show that covered a wide variety of topics, um, and uh, and and then, you know, it turned into including paranormal stuff. And by ninety six, ninety seven, it had it had firmly turned into this is this is Art Bell. It's sort of what you know what we all remember it being. It wasn't always like that, but um, but by ninety six, ninety seven, it clearly had turned into that. All right. Uh, let's take a quick break yeah. and we'll 
Back in a moment with Aaron and Mike. Where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR, Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to WhereDidTheRoadGo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. So, we're back with Aaron Gullius and Mike Cleland. UFO History Part 6. The 19, late 1990s, anyway. And uh, with 1998, we had uh, Whitley Strieber publishing Confirmation. And if I remember right, that's the one where he was talking about the implants. Yeah, he was working with um, Roger Lear at the time, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I've never really been sure what to make of these implants. Have you had any experience with them, Mike? Uh... <clears throat> You know, I've spoken directly with Roger Lear a bunch of times. I've spoken with a handful of folks who have actually had the implants removed from their body. I've talked to people who have had that experience. Um, I have uh, talked to the fellow who has worked closely with Roger Lear. Uh, his name is, um, oh God, I'm trying to, Stephen Colbert. And uh, so... There is so so. I'm convinced that yes, there's something to this, the the implants. Yes, I I. Uh, you know the the number of people who claim implants. You know some people, some researchers will say, oh, you know, there's not that many implants out there. You know, like if anyone says if they, you know, people say they have an implant, you know, got to be really skeptical. And then just on the other side of the, there's other researchers out there says anyone who's had an abduction experiences, experiences. has an implant. Has an implant. So. so. Hmm. Have, have you you yourself had any any reason to suspect one? Well, there's a. Well, there's oops, a, I'm getting an echo in the background there. It sounds like the aliens like are talking aliens. to us. Oh my gosh, yes, it is a little bit. <laughs> sounds a little bit like we're we're in the like in the 1960s when people would you know smoke pot. They would have that echo, you know. So is it still doing it? No, no, it's solved. No, okay. Okay. Um, I uh, I don't think I have any. And and the the this is like so much like so much uh, like of all of this stuff. Like I don't know how do you know any answer to any of this stuff? So, um, I can't be. Uh, yeah. So so like as far as my own personal involvement, it's it's. I, I'm questioning it now. This there there was for a while at the UFO conferences a booth where a fellow would uh, scan you with a <laughs> black light. It was quite interesting, actually, and there is that's one of the things a lot of researchers will do. We'll scan people after they have a reported event, and there is supposedly a fluorescence that will show up that uh, won't show. You know, like and I mean, quite honestly, like handprints on the walls. You know, like of of you know four fingered alien hands in the wall kind of thing, and and um, and so and then there was also uh, this fellow would just take what amounted to a. This is this is not you know, uh, cutting edge science here, but this is, was very interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, a Stanley stud finder as well as another, you know, some more, you know, Geiger counter and an FM receiver and a, uh, a magnetometer and things like that would, you know, a Gauss meter and things like that would run these around your body. And, um, there were, he was finding anomalous little beeps that would show up on people. And it was very interesting because some of the people would, you know, be UFO experiencers and they would have a lot of little beeps going off around their bodies. And then, you know, other people who were just doing it as a lark wouldn't be getting anything. So, uh, hmm. I can't really speak to, you know, I mean, it, like I'm not a scientist and, and this is scientific type research. I haven't seen any, uh, like long-term data on this, but it was very interesting. I did it a couple of years in a row. Now, so here's, here's my, my little test. So went in one year and then, uh, the guy's super busy, totally slammed at these conferences. So I went in, so one I year went in and, uh, and, uh, he found, oops, I got a little echo again. He found a little anomalous beep, um, between my ring and middle finger on my left hand. Hmm. And I went in a year later 
and he f- and a couple other places behind both ears, and then on uh, my left foot, I believe, near my toes. So just found a little anomalous beep. With a this is with a hardware store Stanley stud finder, and then uh, so I went back the year later, and I remembered exactly where all those things were. And he was like, looked at me like I have no idea what we talked about last year. And it's like, well, let's just go through this. And so he, you know, scanned my whole body, and they showed up exactly in the same places. So, you know, was I somehow, was my psyche like wanting it to happen? Did I interact with the Stanley stud finder on some sort of, you know, you know, was my ESP like sending telepathy out to the Stanley stud finder to make it, you know, match what I remembered the year before? I don't know. And, um, but it was very, uh, it was interesting. So, uh, you know, and that said, I do know some folks who have actually gone under the knife and had these things removed. And I've talked to them at length, and I've actually talked to to uh, Roger Lear at length uh, about these things, kind of in a much more casual setting. And um, I was in a uh, UFO support group. This is in Laughlin, Nevada, at a UFO conference, and I think it was Leo Sprinkle. It was Leo Sprinkle who was running the support group, so you can picture like a Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, a bunch of people sitting <laughs> in a room, and and there was a little talk of implants, and another person would say, "Well, you know, I had this experience, and I would think I have an implant," and, and so. Leo, who's been a, you know, obviously done tons of group therapy over in, in his, you know, 60 years of, of being a clinician, um, said, okay, wait a minute, let's, let's ask everyone in the group, you know, who in the group here thinks they've had an implant? And so just imagine every, probably half the people in this room, so 30 people in the room, 15 people raise their hand, maybe over half. And then he says, okay, and, and I'm sort of in the back, and this is very early on in my sort of dig, digging into this stuff, and I'm in the back, and I don't have any knowledge of anything, so I didn't raise my hand, but I would just watch this happen. And, and he said, okay, now everyone, um, you know, where do you think they are? Point to where they are. And I'll tell you, every single person pointed down to their right shin between their mm-hmm. knee and their, everyone did it at the same time. It was, it was a rem- shocking experience. And uh, so I don't know quite what to make of that. Um, and that is actually a place where people report these things getting uh, removed, as well as a spot where people will report the scoop marks, which there was a really ugly and actually poor rendition of the uh, textbook scoop marks on the, the girl's stomach in the oh, X-Files. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, they look like Swiss yeah. cheese or something as opposed to... Yeah. Um, um, actually, I have a friend who did one of the... Uh, Listener stories thing. Uh, you can find the video on our YouTube. And he had seen, uh, if I'm remembering, he had at least one weird UFO sighting and has a what he thinks is an implant in his leg. I mean, he's very open-minded where he just doesn't know what it is. But he said if he pushes on it and uh, it burns. Yeah. I mean, I, this is, I met a fellow. This is like, you know, this Leo Sprinkle was like, you know, said, oh, you should talk to this guy. And this, we're walking through the parking lot and, and uh, he said, here, just talk to this guy. And Leo says, I got to go. And so there I am standing next to this guy. And he's like, uh, it's like, so, you know, like, what's your story? And he's like, well, uh, anyway, I talked to him for a, a minute. And he says, and he rolls his sleeve up and he's got this bump, this big bump under his, you know, I think it's on his arm. It's on his arm. It's so, and he's like, you know, this thing, I remember it going in. I remember them putting it in as a, like 11 year old boy. I woke up the next morning. I told mom, these beings came in my room. They put this in my body as an 11 year old boy. And he let me touch it and play with it. And, and, uh, and you know, mom said, oh, it was just a bad dream. And he said, nope, I remember it going in. And it didn't look like a mole, didn't feel like a, you know, like a cyst or anything like that. Not that I would really know, like have a you know, wide range of what that might feel like. But so here's this guy. He's got this little thing. And, and um, you know, and I said, have you ever thought of getting it removed? And he said, oh, no, don't want to piss him off, you know. So uh, <laughs> and then he said, okay, nice meeting you and walked away. And this is like, so that, so the, the, one of the problems with doing this and becoming so immersed in this is that, you know, you end up with a thousand stories like that, that, you know, where do they lead to? How do you connect the dots to these things? So. Yeah. Any, any thoughts, Aaron? Um, the implant thing is, um, I haven't read confirmation, but, but the implant thing is, I think, fascinating because it's, it's really, really tangible and physical. And there's no way to... I mean, unless you just sort of 
issue a blanket denunciation of everybody who's found these implants or had them removed or had them sensed in the presence of others by somebody who they, you know, probably didn't set things up in advance with, right? Unless you denounce all of this as a massive con, you've got to you've got to deal with it, right? So um I, I think it's it's fascinating. I think the implant thing is one of those things that sort of pushes me in my preferred direction of some kind of sneaky, horrible, horrifying terrestrial explanation for some of these things. Um, because it, it's, I mean, it might not be whatever they pull out, you know, recognizable Earth technology, but, you know, neither is a bunch of stuff they're working on everywhere that we don't know about, right? So right, it, right. it's one of those things that, that really... I mean, more than more than the probing and the stories of, you know, alien hybrid fetus implantation or whatever, this this stuff about the implants and, and just the the number of people who have reported things like this um, is one of the things that sort of, you know, creeps me out more than than other things, because this is I mean, it not saying it's, it's alien technology, but you know, people are having weird experiences and then getting bits of metal pulled out from under their skin. That's weird. Um, that's weird and a little bit sinister. So um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's fascinating. Um, and I, I like you, Mike. I have no idea how to connect the dots with all of these all of these stories. You know, it, it's and I kind of wonder if if we need to. You know, hmm. so, because these are, you know people's experiences and, and sometimes we can get so sort of obsessed with well what's the big picture you know you sort of forget you're talking to a person who has had what might be a, a pretty you know horrific trying experience and um you know sometimes just focusing on on the individuals and and, and the stories and, and their um and, and their personal you know encounters is um as fulfilling as it needs to be now, um, they did do a TV show, a TV special on confirmation as well. I think on NBC or something. Was that it? Yes, I think it was NBC. It's actually pretty good. Um, and there was a fellow there. Oh, I can't remember his name now. Who was one of the abductees? Um, and I want to say Terry, but that's not right. Um, but he's definitely featured in the book confirmation as well as in. There was a kind of a companion book that came out. I think it was called, you know, like. Whitley Strieber's series or something like that. And it was a, uh, it was basically a book written by, um, uh, Roger Lear. And, uh, so yeah, that, 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 that show is pretty good. And, uh, you know, Whitley Strieber plays one of the hosts and there is a narrator there who, who's got a deep sort of scary voice and plays, you know, <laughs> plays it for maximum drama. But yeah, that one's worth watching. I'm not sure if that's even available on YouTube right now. I would think it would have to be somewhere. I think it's out there somewhere, but I, I've actually seen it on YouTube, but I haven't seen it recently. And uh, even though it was on NBC, I don't think it really made it that much more visible than it already was. Yeah. But uh, um, I do I want to ask you this, Aaron. Yeah. So, well, I, I know you said that, that the government conspiracy type of thing is one of your preferred explanations for some of this. How much of this do you think is truly anomalous versus terrestrial government run in some way? 47.9% anomalous. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, do you think it's like like a 50-50 thing or do you think most of it's government related? I, I, or I think there is probably it's, it's more than 50% terrestrial terrestrial shenanigans um whether it's government corporate some collusion of the two which is usually the way things are um it, it it's um yeah i i think it's more simplest explanation sometimes is the best one and things that originate on this planet might be more might be simpler now getting into the really weird stuff can things be alien and beyond this planet right so mm, right. um the whole are we really alone here is this phenomenon or these phenomena things that are a natural part of the world around us that we just don't comprehend yet um so i i don't know i it just i can't really put a number on it but i i think probably at least half 
of some of the, the things, especially things with, with physical traces, are are probably. Um, I think there's a good chance they're they're terrestrial in, in some way. Now, for what reason and who's behind it, I I'm not sure. I want to speculate, um, especially not on the airwaves where people will hear me <laughs> and track me down and put me in a little room. But um, yeah, and not, not the aliens. Please, aliens. I'd rather go with you than the CIA. But um, it, it, it's. I, I think it. There's a. I. I. Yeah. Earth stuff. What, what, what about you, Mike? <laughs> well, it's interesting because I mean, this is the one of the problems with this is that um, you know, there's a fellow named David Marlar who wrote, put a book out on triangular UFOs, and he used the term unambiguous UFO. You know, like, oh. so you see, <clears throat> excuse me, you see a little dot way off in the sky, right? And it's kind of like make some odd maneuvers in the sky and like, hmm, you know, UFO. And could that be a little drone? Could it be some sort of man-made technology? Yes, at, at this point, of course, you know. Um, now, you know, I've also talked to other people who said, yep, saw a flying saucer, you know, like on my backyard so close that I couldn't believe it wasn't touching the glass in the back door, you know. Uh, and... So that would probably not be a man-made craft, you know, right. from what he was describing, you know. So, you know, these unambiguous sightings, you know, these unambiguous situations, you know, like little dots in the sky, sure, you know, those could be terrestrial at this point. Yeah, I mean, even some kind of, I mean, this drone technology is, or whatever, there's stuff going on that we don't know about, obviously, that could very well you know, to the untr- to anyone's eye, I mean, the trained eye, I suspect it could come across as alien technology when it's perfectly terrestrial. It's a right. lot of money thrown at it. So, you know, I just fi- you know I just finished this big fat book on owls and stuff like that, and I have to think that you know, like the weird stories that were emerging out of that st- out of that book, you know, like the government would. There's no way anything would anyone terrestrial oh, would yeah. stage that kind of stuff. It just yeah, is like I mean- so. So that, like, I mean, I, I feel kind of, you know, 100% of the stuff in that, you know, in that, well, I want to be careful. I'm there, I'm throwing around, pers- <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm using percentages, you know, to, to, to I'm, I'm uh, cooking the books in essence by saying that. So, um, you know, so there's we- the weirds, the stuff that intrigues me, let me put it that way. Here, I'll start that I'll start all over again. The stuff that intrigues me is this fringy, weird stuff that just defies any simple answer. And I suspect strongly that very little of that is is coming from a terrestrial source. It may be yeah. coming from a terrestrial source that's like, you know, the totem animal spirits of, you know, the great, right. you know, uh, mystical beyond that is somehow incorporated to the to the earth so it could be terrestrial on by that definition um but it's not you know some guy in a think tank with a you know with a lot of money creating the the stories that intrigue me that's my dream job um being a think tank (laughs) with a lot of money to mess with people's heads um mike in in the out you mentioned the owl book there's um i i'm i'm in the middle of reading it and uh there's a line that you um, that you sort of pulled from uh, from Ann Streber, I think um, something along the lines of, if if it's not weird, I don't believe it. Um, as far yeah, as you it, know, people's people's uh, you know sort of paranormal accounts, like there has to be some. That's, you, you mentioned something about about um, sort of these fundamental fundamentally paradoxical events as being hallmarks of of these true paranormal experiences, a, a big sort of triangle flying through the air. It's like, Oh, that's a cra- I mean, when you come right down to it, that is a craft that I am not familiar with is a lot different than I had a weird entity device thing, half real, half not floating outside my, my backyard, you know, and it seemed to be reading my brain, you know, that's a weird sort of thing that citing a strange craft might not be. So I, I think that's a, that's a good dividing line. Is it, is it weird in a way where we, with our, you know, notions of, of Western rationality or whatever, we, we, we just cannot comprehend why anything would be doing anything like this. That, that sort of just the, you'll, cliched phrase high strangeness as sort of being one of these these marks of of something truly anomalous uh yeah Our, yeah i agree and that course i agree i guess because you're sort of i'm, I'm quoting, quoting you, my so. book in a way yeah so <laughs> using his resource so of course i agree yeah i think that ann streber that she said she had a bs detector that was her bs yeah. detector. you know if it wasn't weird she didn't believe it <laughs> nice 
All right. You're on WVBR FM Ithaca. Uh, next up is uh, the Black Eyed Kids, which are kind of like a side thing to the UFO phenomena, much like um, uh, cattle mutilations are, where a lot of people think they're connected, but there's not necessarily a direct a direct line and, there. and crop circles. There's very little direct yeah. evidence of you know. Sometimes there's UFOs in crop circles, but those tend to be little round orange balls of light. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and th- this phenomena. When I first heard it, my my instinctual response was, "This is this is a uh, modern folklore. This is you know urban myth." And until I talked to David Weatherly, who you know has talked to so many people who have had these experiences, and I started saying, "Okay, maybe maybe there's something to it." And David, I've I've talked to at length with David Weatherly about the Black Eyed Kids thing, and um, and it sounds it's interesting because this was before I started the Owl Book, and he describes something very similar to me when I was doing the Owl Book, where these stories would just arrive, like he just these they just get one story, and then just you know somehow another story would arrive, and and so he accumulated this amazing book through just this magical process of I mean obviously you're putting some intention out there, and you're getting results back from that, but um, yeah, that's a powerful book, and. And uh, I was listening to David Weatherly talk on Tim Banal, and they were talking about the Black Eyed Kids thing. And Tim Banal was was uh, uh, you know sort of asking some questions, and I was working doing illustration work, so I was at my desk and I had these desk lamps, you know, and I like the paper really lit really well. So I pull these, you know, with a with a kind of gooseneck arms, I pull them real close to the paper and I'm leaning right over there. So the thing's close to the paper, my face is close to the paper, my face is close to the lamp. And I, uh, he's talking and, and uh, Tim Banal is asking kind of questions like, well, you know, like, well, you know, what do you ever think? Well, how would you act with if, if one of these things came into your life? And I thought to myself, well, you know, like I made a pretty tough stuff at this point. You know, like I probably would keep my cool if uh, if like one of these black eyed kids like, you know, ended up, you know, like knocking on my door. And as soon as I had that thought, bam, the light bulb in the lamp ex exploded and there was like oh, psh, like man. a big flash of light and broken glass all over my my desk That's and all creepy. over the paper and all over my hands <laughs> so yeah no. that's scary. i uh so I don't know what to. So that's my that's my take on the black eyed kids thing is the sense that like wow you know you can just think about them and then the light bulbs start blowing up you know so I'm, I'm watching seems, the light bulb at my desk here right now very carefully. It seems to me like there's a there's a lot of similarities too to men in black encounters when you, when you look at these black eyed kid encounters. Go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Um, but, but, but I was I don't know much about the Black Eyed Kid thing, but I think just from what I've read and from what I've seen in the graphics that show up and everything, um, as far as a connection to to UFO stuff, I think it's it's mostly the the aesthetic aspect of the big black eyes. Um, the actual encounters, you know, the you know these strange, you know children sitting on somebody's step when they come home or or walking down the road looking kind of out of place it really strikes me much more as a um a a sort of folklore fairy story you know creepy entity sort of thing rather than um it's it's paranormal-ish to be sure but but i think the ufo thing i think people have flashed onto the 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 eyes the sort of you know wide staring black eyes and that's that's sort of the connection but it, it it, um, it, especially, I was, I was sort of, you know, doing some Googling about this a while back, and, and what struck me is, is I think it was on, I don't know, probably in the Wikipedia page or something, but often seen panhandling, you know, or hitchhiking, and I was just like, it's like they're, it's like, almost like a, um, like a, uh, and I don't mean this pejoratively, almost like a, a, a gypsy stereotype, sort, sort of a, mm-hmm. a, a wanderer stereotype, like strange, ethereal, wandering children who aren't quite right and i'm like that is so much creepier than flying saucers um <laughs> and and you know just just the i know it's all you know photoshop or whatever but the pictures of it creep me out uh it, it's it's strange stuff it's it's great fodder for horror films um i don't know if there have been any black-eyed kid horror films made but there should be and there probably will be after we all get bored with the topic but um it, it's it's a it's it's a neat thing, and what I like about it is, and I, I tend to look at these things in terms of what do I like about it, um, about the idea is, is that we're we're getting back to that weird, creepy things that have always been a part of our world that we just can't explain, whether we call them fairies or leprechauns or 
black-eyed children. Uh, and I keep wanting to say black-eyed peas, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always on the verge of, of saying that when I say black-eyed children. Um, I, I think it's, I don't know if this is a dumb way to say it, it's kind of refreshing. It's a little bit more interesting than than the endless and the, the endless ghost tales or endless flying saucer tales or stories about um about exopolitics or underground bases these are weird creepy kits um takes me back to when i first read the uh, the middish cuckoos or you know the village of the damned source materials like weird kids who don't do what they're supposed to do and who freak you out that's that's a classic and i i think it fits into that uh, into that genre, and if, is there some some truth behind it? Well, there's probably as much truth behind this as there is any of these, um, any of these sort of sort of lingering tales. I, I think the the UFO connection also comes through with the the theory that these things are the hybrids, the hybrids between aliens yeah. and humans. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just as far as the um, the, you know, I've talked to many, well, not many, but a, enough women who claim to have met their hybrid children and it's not like a black eyed kid thing at all. Usually these things, these the kids that they are meeting are very benevolent and very, very like exuding a form of like existential knowledge and, and universal like radiating a form of love basically. So, um, so that, that hybrid child from the spacecraft, it would be perfect if you were an X file script writer it doesn't really match the accounts of people who have who have claimed to have met their own kids in these spacecraft type environments. Right. That's interesting. Right. That that's an interesting sort of bit that never really gets out is that, you know, like you said, you, there are people who, you know, these hybrids, you know, there are stories of like you said women who have met met them and that doesn't get out there. Those stories don't get out there as much in, in my just my observation you know there's always a sense that they're making hybrids well where are they well they're either in incubators or they're evil little black-eyed kids um but there's this whole other segment of you know the the sort of serial encounters with with this uh with this phenomenon where like you said women meet these supposed hybrids and it's it's not a horrifying experience yeah and that, and that doesn't mean that universally across the board that's how it's playing out, but that's the consistent pattern of the folks I've spoken with. Except when they're infants, when it is, does tend to be kind of creepy and these things are look like almost diseased and listless and Ugh. don't have, you know, so. Ugh, that's weird. <laughs> it's very weird, I, yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. <laughs> So in 1999, uh, John Mack released his second book on aliens and his last book, unfortunately, I believe, with Passport to the Cosmos. And uh, that was actually the one where I found John Mack. I had been so kind of bored with the UFO thing at that point. I was still reading, you know, Valet and uh, Strieber, but I went into a bookstore and said, I want something else. I want something new. And saw that and picked it up and went, well, this sounds interesting. And just absolutely loved his work when I read that. That book had a huge impact on the way I frame this, these, these events. I mean, the, 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 so the, that book, Passport to the Cosmos, a simplistic way to look at that book is he compares and contrasts the initiation rites of the shaman to the modern UFO folklore. And it, 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 he does a beautiful job of summing them, these two things up and looking at them, um, uh, you know, in comparison. And uh, <clears throat> there's a chapter in the Owl book on shamanism, and believe me, I borrowed heavily from, from the thinking of John Mack for that. Um, that. That had a remarkable impact, and that is something I've actually found in the people I talk to who have had the direct contact experience, is in the aftermath of these experiences, that they somehow, not 100%, but enough that there's a pattern, these people had these experiences will if not become shamans outright which i have a few examples of that they will perform a shamanic role they'll be reiki healers they'll be therapists they'll be doing some sort of esoteric psychic work um, you know uh so yeah yes yeah, so that book was amazing for for that alone yeah 
I, I think the uh, I think that's a, a huge part of the whole abduction experience. May very well be these very similar to what shamanistic encounters are, and that that sort of uh, enlightenment. It's done in a different way, but I think they're probably accessing the same thing. Yeah, it's like when I when I'm talking about. I think it first sort of shows up when I'm talking about sort of sort of you know um, Central African traditional religion in class, and I, I sort of talk about shamanism and and sort of the, you know, its role in sort of pantheism and thing animism, not pantheism, animism. Uh, the way I sort of explain it to students is is shaman were the people who were believed to have a more direct conduit to the supernatural sort of sort of a you know mediator between the natural and unnatural worlds and um and 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 what is the abduction experience but crossing this liminal space from a natural to some kind of supernatural world so i I think that the the shamanism thing is really interesting i don't know if it was in the i can't remember if i read the book but i heard and read some interviews with uh, with with john mack about the book and and one thing that really jumped out at me is is when he's discussing the shamanism he uh, he um he name drops a credo uh what's his name mutwa the uh african shaman And, and what what struck me about that is that um, is that uh, Credo Mutwa was also really sort of hooked up with David Icke uh, back in um, back in '99, uh, 2000 or so, when his uh, biggest secret book where he dropped the whole reptilian thing in a big way. And and, and so I was I, I found that 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 um, um, Max or not Mac, uh, yeah Mac, uh, Max use of of Credo Mutwa and shamanism is like, yes, this is how you make these connections. No, you don't talk about physical reptilians from the lower fourth dimension imitating the Queen, David Icke. You you talk about shamanism in its broad sense and connect it to to the strange. So I, I really did appreciate that that sort of, um, if I can say it this way, sh- um, spiritual uh, connection uh, that um, that Mac made with these phenomena and, and later graham hancock made that connection too in, in his book supernatural yes. when he starts researching shamanism and altered states and suddenly i think he picked up a book on by valet or whatever and was like wait a minute this might be the same thing yeah, yeah. it's it's the modern form of shamanism yep so it, in this in the you know the shamanic initiation in the the lore, I mean, in the traditions, you know, no one says, like, I want to become a shaman. You know, they will uh, be chosen by the tribe somehow. And then, you know, so they don't, nobody asks to be a shaman. They are chosen against their will to be a shaman. And uh, and that's, you know, that's the UFO contact experience in many ways. You know, these people are like, why me? And that's the same thing in the shaman in the village would be like, well, why me? You know, why, you know, so... Uh, yeah, very really interesting stuff. Yeah, you know, that really that really shaped a lot of the way I frame this stuff. All right. And I think that's the last thing I had listed for the 1990s. And so I think that's probably a good place to stop. And we'll have to do a part 7 <laughs> to finish off the last 16 years. Well, did anybody really think we'd finish it? I mean, well, let's be you never honest. know. It, it, it could have happened. <laughs> Um, there was a lot of interest. There, there was more interesting stuff in the '90s, in a sense, than than I think it looks like when we listed it out. Yeah. Well, you know what the '90s were in a in a big way was that was the sort of, you know, the it was the late '80s that uh, Communion came out, and then the splash that that made really, you know, the ripples kept on reverberating well into the '90s. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, what's the uh, the TV show uh, for unexplained. Um, Oh. Sighting, unsolved mysteries. Thank you. Unsolved mysteries had a lot of actually, yeah, with Robert Stack had actually quite a good amount of what amount is obviously very tabloid in the way it was presented, but it it really covered the abduction thing very yeah. well. There was and, also that show uh, Sightings as well, which was a very similar format, which I don't remember as clearly. Yeah. The thing about <laughs> unsolved mysteries was. Um, and I'll say this very quickly because we're out of time. But um, Unsolved Mysteries was because it was a broad show that covered, you know, these bank robbers are on the run or whatever. It had a much broader audience than people who would yeah. sit down and watch something like Sightings. So you had people thinking they were watching a show about unsolved murders, 
you know, suddenly get, you know, a dose of the Cash Landrum incident. Right, or, you right. Know, and, and so that was... Um, that and was, taken on the same level. Right. I mean, treated the same way. I mean, the, the production, the narration, it wasn't like, and now our goofy flying saucer story of the week. It right. was, here's another, you know, unsolved mystery. So I, I thought that was a, a... That probably did, you know, as much to, to popularize... Um, the UFO thing in the nineties as, as anything. And, uh, you both have new books out. So Mike, would you like to, Oh, I'll play. I'll play. I gotta, yeah, I gotta eat. So, um, uh, I just published a book. It's called the messengers. Was it published the last time we talked? No, it was, it was you were just in the, in the, it was so uh, the for... last time we did this was September, if I remember. Oh right. my gosh! Okay, so as of December, early December of this last year, it's now February fourth, so it's been out for two months. Uh, I published a book it's called The Messengers. The subtitle is Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee. Um, I it's I just simply refer to it as the Owl Book, uh, and uh, it's easily uh, sought out on Amazon and things like that. So uh, you can go to my website, which is uh, hiddenexperience.blogspot.com. I'll repeat that, hiddenexperience, all one word, .blogspot.com. And you can um, find it there and links to it. And uh, it has been, I am very happy to say, it has been very well received for the most part. And, um, and it was about three years in the making. And I'm really happy that it's, that it's out and actually you know that I that I actually finished the thing, and it was in, you're in the middle of the process of doing a book like this. You kind of you're like, oh my god, will it ever happen? Is this really going to happen? You lose your mind in the middle. But I'm very very happy that it's out and and available now. I uh, I have heard nothing but praise about it. I haven't started it yet, but uh, I'm going to soon, and then we'll have you back on to talk about that exclusively. Uh, I know we did one interview a couple of years ago. I want to say at this point, and uh, that was on. A, oh yeah, yeah, that was when on an started, essay. That was was in essence the foundation for for the, the yeah. book project. I did an essay that was about forty pages long, and now the book is nearly four hundred pages long. So I just took that es- essay, multiplied <laughs> it by ten, and then that's the book. Yeah. So, so we'll set that up soon. And Aaron, you just published what? Yeah, uh, conspiracy theories, the roots, themes, and propagation of paranoid political and cultural narratives. Basically, what it does is in uh, in two hundred pages or so takes some of the big trends in conspiracy theory narrative from basically the 80s, 90s up to the present and, uh, and, and sort of looks for what historical kernel of truth might, uh, might be there. The example I always use is, um, yes, the CIA did some really spectacularly heinous experiments with mind control in the 1950s. That does not necessarily mean that Kathy O'Brien was hunted by a, a a lust enraged Dick Cheney in a forest at some point, like she claims. So the bizarre overblown conspiracy theories that became popular, what truth is behind them and how did these stories change over time is, uh, is sort of what it does. And uh, I tried to stick to ones that might not be as well known. So there's no big JFK stuff because every the, the whole mountains of books on JFK, but I do have Peter Beater's organic robotoid doubles of president carter that i discuss so it's weird stuff well we'll have you on to talk about that soon as well excellent all right i thank you guys and we'll set up uh maybe what might be the last part uh in a few months sounds good all right thanks guys thank Thank you so much all right and there you go part six of the history of the ufo phenomena